Hey everybody, welcome back to Beyond and welcome to Momentum. This session is really focused on journalists of color sharing how the industry can meet this moment. Retention has been an issue of diversity efforts in journalism since white owned outlets started hiring BIPOC journalists. To better understand why journalists of color become leavers, Carla Murphy, a leaver herself, conducted an exit interview of this demographic. For three weeks, this February through March, more than 100 leavers, 81% of whom were women of color and half of whom were black, responded to an ethical and practical call to gather exit data. Two, serve as a resource for current students and journalists of color who are making career decisions, often in isolation, in an industry in crisis, and help newsroom managers to improve the retention of journalists of color, particularly through mid-career. The data corroborates the Whisper Network's news and this project's central hypothesis that journalists of color leave at mid-career. Most leavers left journalism because they decided to, not because they couldn't find sufficient or any work, company downsizing, restructuring or buyout, or retirement. Also note, one third of leavers said they had managerial duties at the time they left. This mid-career leakage of experience, potential leadership and representation matters. It raises questions about the timing of diversity initiatives at the start of the career pipeline and their return on investment for both the industry and communities that newsrooms serve. Proceeding along this line of inquiry reframes the newsroom as the problem, not levers, inability to fit, nor lack of training. You may ask yourself why these individuals left journalism. To understand that, you should first understand why these levers got into journalism. Overwhelmingly, the most common reason these levers got into journalism was public service, and they viewed journalism as a calling. By the end of their careers, however, most came to view it as a job or worse. Towards the end, journalism was. Still identity, but like when your identity is also a disease you have, something weighing me down every day. Death march. Not what I was doing. Recall that most respondents left journalism because they decided to. To better understand their reasons, the survey asked respondents to rank nine provided newsroom and industry influences. The top factors for leaving were workplace stress, low pay, and newsroom mismanagement. Many of the leavers expounded on why they left journalism. It was clear management didn't care about journalism. Just ratings, clicks, sensationalism. The hours were bad, the pay was bad, and management was horrible. Expectations were unrealistic and ridiculous. I still maintain that the only people still in the business just want to be on television. I resent my experience in news so much, and sometimes I wish I'd studied something else. It became less about helping people and more about helping the station stay afloat and make money. I felt like my talents were ignored or sidelined in favor of clearly less talented or qualified non-Black journalists routinely. I rarely got the support or mentorship needed to thrive. And it left me deeply disheartened that in the upper echelons of journalism, diversity can often equate to tokenism, and that regardless of your pedigree, two de degrees from top tier schools, including an Ivy League J school, that blackness can be as much an asset to managers in the newsroom as a liability. It was draining, constantly not being heard when I would stick up for people of color, dealing with white managers who were disconnected from the city, also dealing with people in power who weren't qualified. It wasn't fun. I felt like I wasn't making a difference. I was paid a lot less than white men and sick of it. My view of journalism as a calling has never changed. I teach future journalists, but as a woman of color, my ability to advance in the profession was limited. The financial element was difficult as I did not receive financial support from family. I began to notice those who excel are white from privileged backgrounds, which allowed them to only focus on journalism because they were financially secure. The industry was becoming harsher, expecting more with less time and money, becoming more about clicks than conduct and was ultimately a stressful burden crippling my mental health. Most of the issues cited in the Lever study are not new, but have been in existence since the beginning of the push 
to integrate white controlled media. As stated in the Media 2070 essay, resistance met efforts to integrate the nation's newsrooms. Few black journalists have worked in white media outlets when the Kerner Commission issued its report in 1968. The report noted that the journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out, hiring, training, and promoting Negroes. The complaint is we can't find qualified Negroes. But this rings hollow from an industry where only yesterday, jobs were scarce and promotion unthinkable for a man whose skin was black. Even today, there are virtually no Negroes in positions of editorial or executive responsibility, and there is only one Negro newsman with a nationally syndicated column. Nearly 50 years after the Kerner Commission, little has changed in terms of representation. Black journalists remain underrepresented in our nation's newsrooms, according to the American Society of News Editors Annual Study, which was first conducted in 1978. In 1964, the passage of the Civil Rights Act resulted in the creation of a Department of Justice agency called the Community Relations Service, which often worked behind the scenes to alleviate racial tensions. In its 1969 report, the CRS observed, Few American institutions have so completely excluded minority group members from influence and control as have the news media. This failure is reflected by general insensitivity and indifference and is verified by ownership, management, and employment statistics. The report noted that no general audience newspaper, magazine, or radio or television station is owned or managed by minority group persons. At that time, Black people owned fewer than a dozen radio stations, and whites owned almost all Spanish language radio and TV stations. Nearly 50 years after the founding of the Association of Black Journalists, we asked journalists of color to share the prejudice they've seen in journalism and the advice they have for newsrooms to retain journalists of color and serve the community well. Here are their reflections. Um, hello, I'm Sewell Chan. I'm the editorial page editor at the Los Angeles Times. I've been a journalist for 20 years. I've been involved in journalism diversity initiatives of some kind of or another, of, of one kind or another, you know, basically since I was a college student. Uh, the Asian American Journalists Association for me was particularly helpful in getting me my start. It gave me um, a college scholarship and a chance to work on a student publication way back in 1995 uh, when I was uh, finishing up my freshman year in college. Um, that same summer, I was hired at the Philadelphia Inquirer actually as an Art Peters uh, copy editing intern, a really terrific program named for a groundbreaking journalist of color himself. And I had a chance to work in the Inquirer newsroom, then located at uh, Broad and Callow Hill, uh, working on the city and South Jersey copy desk. And that was an incredible opportunity for me. And one really created for me and, and the, the path was the, trail was blazed by the people of color, especially African Americans, who really came before us and were the first, you know, really were the first, the pioneering generations who tried to break into mainstream newsrooms and to try to um, uh, make them more diverse, inclusive, and representative of changing America. Now we all know, especially now in 2020, that that effort has lasted well over a half a century, and it is really woefully incomplete to read the words of the Kerner Commission in 1968 and it's dire warnings about how the press needs to be more inclusive, needs to be more representative, needs to tell more voices, um, and to read that, you know, only some progress has been made since then. I don't want to say none, but I think we can all agree that it's not nearly uh, what's needed. So I guess I would break down the problem uh, into really, you know, a few different buckets. Um, who gets to tell the stories? Whose stories are being told? And who are we telling them for? And we've really got to think as journalists about all three levels, because I think the assumptions that have kind of guided us, especially in mainstream media, especially in legacy media, I think a lot of those assumptions are being upended. Um, who tells the stories is obviously changing. Our society is now only 60% non-Hispanic white. We're going to need a lot of journalists from different backgrounds to help tell the stories of America. And sometimes it gets framed as, do we just need journalists telling the stories of the communities they happen to come from? I happen to think that that's not true. I'm very proud to be Asian American, proud to be a New Yorker, came from a working class family. I'm also uh, openly gay. 
Um, but I actually have not in my own career really done that much writing about the communities that I'm a part of. I, I wouldn't mind doing that at all, but just my career has taken me in somewhat different directions. A mix of local investigative reporting when I was in DC, some foreign reporting during the Iraq war. Um, I covered local news in New York City for many years. Um, then I ended up as an opinion editor and now um, continuing to do opinion journalism at the Los Angeles Times. So, you know, it's not really about you know, it's not about pigeonholing people, but it's about exposing, broadening the range of opportunities to the maximal number of journalists. So that's that's who whose story, who gets to tell the story. In terms of whose stories get told, I mean, that's pretty clear that America is so rapidly changing. And if we don't tell the story of American change, we're not going to be able to help our society make sense of that change. Now, I don't think the press is primarily the driving force behind the polarization in our society. I happen to believe that it's about inequality about um, geographical uh, um, polarization, a lot of different factors, erosion of trust in institutions, erosion of trust in elected officials um, that's been going on many decades. And it's not, there's clearly a lot of blame to go around. I'm less interested in the blame than I am in the solutions. And I think that press, the pr a free press can, through accountability and through accurate storytelling and holding power to account, can help heal America. And just as importantly, bring people of different communities together in a public square because we desperately need spaces, both digital and physical, um, where we can communicate with each other, where we have trusted facts, and you know, a diverse media is part of that. And then finally, which audience are we trying to speak to? I think that's a profoundly important question and one that I've tried to give a lot of thought to the last few years. My whole career has been in kind of mainstream press. You know, I, I think that's partly, you know, I always like to say, I, I love newspapers not because they're printed on paper and start, were started in the 19th century. That's frankly somewhat irrelevant. I love newspapers because they still do the bulk of original accountability journalism in America in service of our democracy. They're not the only ones. We have a lot of nonprofit newsrooms, a lot of digital only news sites, a lot of innovation going on in this space. But we can't forget that newspapers are still part of the pillar, part of the center of the journalism ecosystem. But that doesn't mean we've been flawless. We really need to look at our where our institutions started, who they historically served, who owned them, and who were they for. Because if we're going to have a better future, we need to understand that we need to be building a multicultural, multi-generational digital audience today. In fact, we needed to start many, many yesterdays ago, but we certainly need to tackle that task with urgency right now. I don't, first of all, I, I don't doubt that the challenges are immense because if we're being honest with ourselves, the, the digital transformation has left many newspapers under-resourced, understaffed, underfunded, under-supported. Um, there's been a whole history of kind of um, very painful transformation and change. A lot of newspapers were owned by chains. Um, newspapers like the Philadelphia Inquirer, like the Los Angeles Times, have now returned to local control, which I think is so important because if the powers that be aren't there in the community, it, first of all, if the ownership and the, or the board of directors or the executive director, what have you, just being local is not necessarily enough. But in my view, it's an important starting point because at least the people are in the community and have a stake in the community. We're not, our newspapers are not, in the case of Philadelphia and Los Angeles, also Boston, Minneapolis, some other cities, we're not owned by a hedge fund or a private equity fund based somewhere else. We're, we're kind of directed by people who at least live in our community. So that's a start. But we've got a, you know, it's an all in moment right now. We need um, guilds and, you know, the, the, we need to harness the activism of the unionization movement going on in journalism, which I happen to believe can be a very powerful force because it's a force for economic justice, but it's also a force for kind of you know, really racial and ethnic diversity and representation. We need editors who are kind of enlightened, frankly, or are trying to get it. You know, the, we, I think one thing we've learned all from this year, we all have our blind spots. We all have our biases. We all have things we don't know. The, the, the you know, the, the goal is not to try to know everything and know everyone's perspective. That's impossible for any of us. The goal, however, needs to be curiosity, openness of heart and mind that I don't know someone else's story or their narrative, I need to take the time to understand it, to have the sensitivity to recognize that I as a manager only really know what I know. And, and I hope, you know, after decades in journalism, I, I know more than I did 20 years ago, but that doesn't mean I know it all. And especially if we're gonna to try to listen to our communities with empathy, we have to really approach our task with humility. And then, um, you know, finally, one thing I'd refer to is, you know, we have to take a harder look at our past. At the Los Angeles Times, one thing that we did 
um, one step, you know, by no means the only step, was to take a hard look at our past from the 19th century, you know, really up through recent decades, and look at the many ways in which the Los Angeles Times, let's face it, didn't speak for the communities of Los Angeles. It really, as we said, it was an institution that was rooted in white supremacy, and we apologized for it. And that's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, it is true that, you know, pretty much, obviously the people alive in the late 19th century are not alive today, but that's not really the point. The point is that as institutions, we have this continuity and that the past has not really passed. You know, people in Los Angeles remember how we covered the 1965 Watts uprising or how we covered um, the Chicano movement in the 1970s, how we then covered the, um, the civil unrest in 1992 and uh, how we covered Prop uh, 187, which was an anti-immigration measure in 1994. And so even, you know, from my generation thinking, well, you know, I was still in school when these things happened, but that's not really the point. The point is that our communities and our audiences have long memories and they remember the sting of being underserved, neglected, stereotyped, dismissed. And we're gonna try to remove that sting and it's not gonna be the work of all of us. And it's gonna take a couple generations, I think, but if we're going to begin to try to remove that sting and that stain, we first have to own up to it, confront it, and accept responsibility. Awesome. But I'm going to stop the recording. The anti-immigrant discourse, especially anti-Mexican and anti-Latino, which with Donald Trump began his campaign of June 16, 2015, put us as a community in the crosshairs of many races. And at the same time, the media, since then, my work as a journalist of color has had more visibility. Even as a freelancer, I received more job offers. I began to receive all types of invitations to speak about my personal experience as a Mexican immigrant and the problems I had to face. I appreciate these new opportunities that have been open to me to speak about our community. I hope they continue to come, but not only because of some particular political climate. I believe that as a journalist, we have a lot more to contribute beyond tragic stories of deportations or of the disparities that we suffer. We have many success stories as well. I also feel it's equally important that you know how we solve problems within our community economically, within the family and education, physical and mental health, security and corruption problems. We have a lot to learn from an other. Like any community, we confront and overcome life's challenges and this comes with opportunities to listen to each other and find ways to solve them together. I have an experience of living in different realities. In Mexico, my beer country, I had the experience to belonging to the ruling class, of being part of the group of the privileged. The fact that some of them, the indigenous and poor people, treat me differently and they give me extra respect. They some look up to me and it made me feel awkward. In Europe, many people make me feel as if, uh, as if, if I was a superior race to, to my pre-Hispanic cultural richness. On the other hand, here in the States, many treat me uh, as if I was worthless, often insinuating that my academic studies were not as a valid. I think that many of us aspire to is not to be viewed as with higher or lower status. We uh, want um, we don't want excessive admiration of with pity. We want to be seen as a equals. This power difference A to A is how we can best learn from each other. Regarding how the newsroom can be made more diverse, I believe that most importantly is not to meet equalities but to go from being diverse to be inclusive, to allow a speech to uh, be less restricted, report the good and the bad as such, with needed to highlight, without needing to highlight something that plays into a political agenda. We need to give more space to grow organically, naturally, and that the position are feeling no just can say um, that you have representativeness, but so you can demonstrate quality.
On the other hand, I believe there that there is nothing that empowers a young person more than hearing and reading the press in the language that many of them speak at home or with their family. In my case, that's Spanish. About 15 years ago, I participated in an alternative multimedia in Italy, which uh, does not have the numbers of immigrants than there are in the United States. In this uh, newspaper, we include a section uh, where we published the main news in different languages. The same was done in the radio program where the news summary was provided into the at least four languages. In Philadelphia, the 16% of population understand Spanish. If you want to be inclusive, starting to publishing in the other language little by little that enriches everyone. Do not let broken English an accent to be impediment to making diverse voice to be heard. That is why I really appreciate this opportunity uh, I have today. Finally, it should be mentioned that we must to go with times, accept that the people in general get more information through the social media through than the through the traditional media. There are more and more communicators that despite the lack of formal training or our degree are being listened to by the community. Journalism has changed and we continue to change. What uh, we need is to integrate formal classic and professional journalism with alternative media. media. Listen to each other, help those who are already communicating information to acquire, acquire skills and resources so they, that they are more accurate in what they report. I think our main job is to regain the trust of the public, the reader, the radio, the radio listeners, etc. People no longer believe in the government or in science, in the scientists or in the media. This can lead to hopelessness and this is a very dangerous thing. We have a great battle in front of us. We need to fight together. Hello, my name is Ernest Owens and I'm a professional journalist here in Philadelphia um, at Philadelphia Magazine. So um, before I was at Philadelphia Magazine, some of the prejudice that I had witnessed in newsrooms that I freelance for, um, places that I work for, um, revolved around a lot of subtle microaggressions. Um, sometimes these were things that were institutionally done um, and sometimes they were just things that would happen in the workplace with um, communication amongst other journalists. One of the things that I had personally experienced um, was a lot of paternalism. Uh, because I was a millennial, because I was um, black, I would often be, you know, given lectures sometimes by older reporters about, you know, being objective and making sure that, you know, I did not let my personal experiences impact the story that pertained around race. And while I, you know, understood that in my actual storytelling and my reporting that I had to make it very clear to stick with the facts, I always felt like I was being singled out and targeted for sharing um, experiences um, that did impact my identities. I think a lot of other journalists have oftentimes wanted to tell certain stories that impact the community, but were oftentimes singled out or either um, given too much of a focus on the issue and not given an ability or flexibility to tell those stories. So for example, um, black journalists that come to newsrooms shouldn't have to feel obligated to tell stories about race. Um, and if they choose to do so, they should be able to have the agency to really tell it through the perspective and experience to which they choose. Um, I remember very early on when I decided to talk about race, um, it was oftentimes white editors and other reporters that I would work with that would try to tell me what they thought was the best effect. I was oftentimes being steered in those situations as well. And this doesn't even speak to the issues around promotions. Um, oftentimes, black journalists are always questioned on if they're ready or not. Um, we're often told, um, you know, that we need to be able to um, work twice as hard. And that doesn't necessarily come from our white peers, but that is just an industry thing that we know that black journalists are oftentimes under a microscope where they're being expected to have to overperform just to get the same opportunities as their white counterparts who probably do not work as much or as hard as they do to attain the same results. And so in certain newsrooms, the question around equity and labor 
um, oftentimes gets ignored in these type of conversations, especially when it comes to black and brown journalists. So here's what newsrooms can do. Newsrooms can begin to start to listen more to what are the legitimate concerns being raised by black and brown journalists. Um, in the current newsroom that I'm in, and I work with at Philadelphia Magazine, we're having direct conversations with each other about these issues. Um, we have created safe spaces and even actual um, whistleblowing policies that allow for reporters to report on issues um, in their newsrooms that are causing problems. So, for example, if there was something that was said at a meeting that made someone uncomfortable, they have a designated person or point person in management that they can feel comfortable sharing those experiences with and knowing that something could get done. A lot of journalists of color do not feel comfortable stepping up and speaking out about a lot of these issues because they feel like it goes into one area and come out the other. And so a lot of newsrooms that I'm currently in um, are in situations where they feel that they can't speak up about these issues or there's going to be something retaliatory. It could be an opportunity that could be mixed. It could be a situation where other people around them are feeling like, you know what? If I speak up, does this mean that people are going to think I'm that black person that is the, the problem, the trouble, the troublemaker or the rebel rouser? Um, I have definitely had those experiences in various newsrooms that I've worked in where when I did raise the issue around diversity, inclusion or issues around representation, that feeling of being singled out as the problem child or the, the difficult one um, creates a message to other journalists especially those who consider themselves to be advocates and support the cause, that they too could be a pariah in the environment. So it's important for newsrooms to create a culture where people can freely express concerns without feeling as though there's going to be retaliation or that this might um, suppress their opportunity to participate in the company or get promotions. A lot of people um, believe that, you know, in some ways, silence is a protection. And that's why we see these incidents that happen at the Philadelphia Inquirer. We see these incidents that happen at the New York Times because so many people get to a point where they feel so silent that then they react in ways that are more outspoken than they probably would have expected. So I think it's very important for newsrooms to really begin to create safe spaces to listen to people um, before they act. Because you cannot create policy, you cannot implement solutions and strategy until you create an environment that's conducive for people to be heard, to be seen, and to be actually amplified. That's my input. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martin Reynolds, and I'm the co-executive director of the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. Very pleased to be here today and thank you for the Lenfest Institute and Cheryl Thompson for giving me the opportunity to share a few thoughts about being a journalist of color in this mad, mad world. Uh, I guess what I really want to just share about this is just this notion that we are really in a moment right now. There's a movement in the streets and there's a journalistic movement that needs to happen in our newsrooms. And the Maynard Institute is the oldest journalism training nonprofit dedicating to helping America's newsrooms reflect the diversity of the nation. And our founders, nine journalists of color, newspaper journalists of color, who were really the first evers in their newsrooms, really were about integrating newsrooms. But now this conversation has really moved beyond that. And what we are talking about is a journal journalistic uh, training organization that focuses on uh, addressing the social fault lines of race, class, gender, generation, geography, sexual orientation, and the like, is that this conversation from started really around diversity and then went, moved on to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We began to flip it on its head to think, well, maybe it ought to be equity and inclusion in service of diversity, because if you've got diversity, but the people there have no equity they have no inclusion, they have no agency, then what you really have is performative diversity. So then here we are, what happened with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, COVID-19. Now this isn't to say that there haven't been people struggling and fighting to get rid of racism in newsrooms for many, many years. I mean, the affinity journalism organizations like NABJ, NAHJ and so forth were founded for that purpose to advocate in service of this. But what we haven't seen to this degree, certainly in the 20 years that I've been in journalism, is these insurrections happening within journalism organizations by journalists of color themselves. 
<clears throat> that's an extremely powerful and critical development. But what we also, this, this time that has also helped us as an institute rethink our own proximity to this conversation around diversity, this conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion, this conversation around equity and inclusion in service of diversity to think, you know, it's not really about inclusion. Because think about being on the schoolyard and people getting picked for teams. You know, the first three people on either side where everybody wanted all those folks on their team, but then the last two people on either side, you got included, but nobody really wanted you there. That's my point about inclusion. Inclusion is like tolerance. So what we as an organization are talking about and also pushing forth through our work with the Vision 25 collaboration with ONA and Open News is to push for institutions of belonging. Because when you belong, you can feel it in your bones. You can feel it in you're not the other. You can feel it in the equitable pay that you receive. You can feel it in the language that you can use in the stories you bring forth. You can feel it in the angles of stories that you can bring forth. You can feel it in the agency that you have to make change or to, affect, or to influence the approach of coverage or any other part of the journalistic enterprise. That is what belonging is. Belonging isn't looking over your shoulder and wondering if you should be here. It's knowing it, it's feeling it. And so as we talk about this kind of, and my concern is, are journalistic institutions ready to do that, ready to embark upon that? I don't know the answer, but I do know the implications for not. We are already living in a society that is more and more polarized, and there continues to be a deep level of distrust towards us in the media. That is only going to accelerate and at times where there's an effort to do more um, subscriber revenue models, and essentially get people to invest in the journalistic enterprise, that's not gonna happen if they don't see themselves and if they don't feel like they belong in the coverage in which we are producing. So my suggestion is to think about an institution of belonging and then work back from that around strategies and tactics to get there. With that, I thank you. Again, this is Martin Reynolds, co-executive director of the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. Stay positive, test negative. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Priya Krishna. Uh, I am the author of the cookbook Indianish, and I am a journalist who contributes regularly to the New York Times food section, uh, among others. So I'll give you a little bit of background about how I got started. Um, my first job out of college was at the independent food magazine, Lucky Peach, started by Chris Ying, David Chang, and Peter Meehan. I was not a journalist there. Um, I worked in customer service. So if you needed you know, to change the address on your subscription or if your magazine never arrived, you called me and I sorted that out. Um, I learned great people skills, I ended up uh, doing all of our advertising, our marketing, our events, um, but ultimately realized that I wanted to write. Um, I didn't know how I was going to write or what I was going to write, um, but right off the bat, I think once I entered the food world, I realized that there was a dearth of voices of color in food. Um, it was a lot of um, white writers writing about their lived experiences. If chefs of color were covered, it was often by a white writer. The writer would then write the story through a white lens or white perspective. And I started to think about how I can um, center marginalized voices in my writing. And I've come to realize that centering marginalized voices isn't just about the subjects of your stories, though I have made a really strong effort to cover a diverse array of people um, and places and things and foods. Um, but I think it's also about using your power and your platform to elevate other marginalized writers, photographers, illustrators, um, etc., to the forefront. Um, I think there tends to be a real crab in the bucket mentality among people of color where there's this idea that only a few of us can succeed when there isn't back space for all of us. And I think a lot of that is born out of the prejudice that we've all experienced at our jobs. So 
you know, for example, at uh, other magazines that I would work for, I'd be sitting in pitch meetings and I'd be surrounded by a mostly white staff. And I noticed what types of ideas had people's heads nodding. It was mostly ideas around pizza, around burgers, around roast chicken. That was sort of seen as the most desirable food to cover. So not only were there not that many POC in these meetings, but I noticed that like the people that ultimately made the decisions, the leaders at the top, those were all white as well. So like you'll note that this form of kind of racism and bias is not blatant. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily obvious at first glance, but it's like deeper and more, I think more insidious. Um, it was things like, you know, only being allowed to cook Indian food on camera when I did video at Bon Appetit. Um, not being treated like a multi-dimensional person who had variety of interests beyond just Indian food. Um, you know, this ended up with um, not only me getting to do less of what I wanted to do, but being paid less than my white counterparts. My white counterparts were allowed to cook whatever food they wanted. We had to stay in our lanes. Um, I've also noticed that um, people of color are often asked to do extra explanation, substitutions, explaining ingredients, sort of trying to make their recipes feel accessible to the mainstream, but my mainstream um, editors really mean a white reader. I think these are all examples of sort of bias that show up in the type of journalism that I do. So if I were to give advice for newsrooms, I would say understand the difference between diversity and equity. Putting POC on staff is not enough. Equity means that POC voices are at the forefront, that they are leaders at the company, and that those perspectives are centered. And for me, I think about how, you know, to me, uh, <laughs> an equitable workplace is one where, you know, roast chicken is not the assumed norm of every household, that we understand the diversity and plurality of spectrums of what American cooking looks like. So, so that is my hope, is that we have more people at the top of mastheads who look like me. Hello, my name is Vanessa Maria Graber, and I am the New Jersey News Voices Manager at Free Press, a uh, national organization that works on media policy um, and uh, reform, and also on the future of journalism. I am also a board member of our local chapter of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. And for the last 10 years, I've been a producer at Philly Cam, um, both on their TV and radio uh, stations. And as a board member of NAHJ, we often hear from our members, we hear their concerns, we check in with them to find out what's going on with them in the workplace. Um, in my role uh, at Free Press, I work with journalists from all over the state of New Jersey, and I also attend a lot of media-related conferences where we talk about the unique challenges faced by um, journalists of color. And then at Philicam, which is a membership organization with more than 800 members um, of content creators, we have many, many uh, discussions and engage in organizing in terms of how to better support Latinx um, content creators and producers. And Philicam itself has a Spanish language training program for journalists and also uh, various Spanish language news and public affairs shows, which I've helped produce. That being said, I've collected a wealth of data along with my own personal experiences to speak to what some of the barriers journalists of color are dealing with. But for this conversation, I want to talk specifically about the Hispanic, Latinx, Spanish speaking community here in Philadelphia. And there are several themes that continue to emerge within these conversations. One um, very important is that there's not enough Latinos who are writing and reporting in these newsrooms, and we really need more of them, especially with our growing population and the huge number of Latin Americans that live in Philadelphia. We simply need more of them writing and creating our stories. The second thing is that um, 
being able to translate and interpret in both English and Spanish is a very special skill and it takes a lot of time and capacity and managers and editors need to really understand how taxing it is to put interpretation and translation on working journalists. Um, this is really a service that should be provided by professional translators and interpreters. Um, although if you had more Spanish speaking reporters and journalists in the newsroom, the workload could be shared across staff instead of constantly coming to the same staff member to translate everything into Spanish or into English. And that there's a, a lot of differences um, in doing that and you can't use Google Translate. And in the notion of just taking your content that's created for mostly white audiences or even black audiences and running that through a translator um, and thinking that that is now uh, content for the Latinx population, um, I think that is uh, really a mistake to think that way. Um, you need to create content specifically for that population in mind and understand what their unique and specific needs are. You can't simply take content and translate it and say, now this is content for the Latinx community. We know the difference and many of us in fact are bilingual and we can tell when content like that has been repurposed. Um, finally, I'll say is that we need more Latinos in management positions to be able to um, mentor, supervise, uh, work well and understand uh, Latino reporters and journalists and content creators. Um, oftentimes we have a lot of cultural insensitivity we have uh, racism and microaggressions, and this makes it really difficult for staff to pitch stories, to be able to um, tell them in the way that's needed, and not to have a lot of their content um, heavily edited and censored because their manager simply doesn't understand the culture or what's trying to be said. Um, I think we also need to understand, lastly, that Latinos are not a monolith. There is a lot of diversity between our populations, which represent over 20 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's not enough to have one Latino journalist to serve a whole bunch of different communities. Um, we really need to have uh, a diversity of Latinos um, who are working there, and that includes Afro-Latinos, indigenous Latinos and multiracial Latinos. So those are the things that are really important um, to the journalists that we work with. They wanna be understood. They wanna be able to tell the stories effectively. Um, there needs to be more diversity in both the, the kinds of Latinx staff that you have and in the kinds of stories that are being presented. And if you want to make content for us, ask us what we want and do more community engagement and collaboration with us in order to better understand these communities. Uh, I think a lot of the media outlets have not spent enough time talking to Latinos and spending time in our neighborhoods to be able to effectively serve our communities through your media content. So those are all the things that I would um, have to say right now. Happy to talk more. You can uh, tweet me at NewsDawn um, or reach me at the conference. And um, I am interested in, in talking more um, both with NAHJ, our organization that works with Latinx journalists, and all of you to improve the conditions in the newsrooms and ultimately better improve the content and serve our communities more effectively. Thank you. Yeah, that's on. Um, hey, Lenfest. Hey, Philly. My name is Carla Murphy. I am the creator of the Lieber survey of 101 former journalists of color speaking about their experiences in the journalism industry. I am coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a city kid. I grew up in uh, Jamaica, Queens. Now I live in Flatbush. I'm an also an immigrant. Um, and this is an immigrant neighborhood that I'm in that's rapidly gentrifying. Um, I am going to hop into these questions. I didn't really prepare. I wanted it to be as unstudied as possible. I hope you don't mind. I'm grateful to be here. Um, so the first question I got is, uh, can you share experiences of how you saw prejudice play out in journalism? Um, I find that difficult to answer. It's kind of like, um, 
me looking at a forest and you asking me to describe different kinds of trees in a forest. Uh, prejudice is, it's in the air, you know, it's the water. Um, so it's hard to pick one strand, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then also I'm being a bit, I, I want to be completely honest. I, because of my experiences in journalism, I'm wary of questions that kind of ask me to share black pain. I think that our industry um, has some kind of fetish or just interest in uh, covering black pain or talking about it, but not in giving black people power or giving black journalists power. Uh, so um, I'm just wary of that kind of stuff. So I'm, I, that's the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry, it's not more than that. Um, the second question is, what advice do you have for newsrooms to support and retain journalists of color? Um, so the first and obvious thing is to pay journalists, period. Just pay them. <laughs> pay them better, pay them what they're worth. Um, quite frankly, all of the salaries that we have now should be probably increased by a good $20,000 um, if you're actually valuing the labor of, the, of your staffer or the rate for your freelancer. Um, but that's a much bigger problem than a single manager can um, solve. So for me, I think that what we need now is not certainly better management all the time, but quite frankly, I think we need leaders and I think we need leadership and we need courage um, because journalism, if we are gonna, if we hope to um, sustainably retain journalists of color, the industry has to change in a very big way. And that's going to take courage and it's going to take leadership. Um, it's going to take courage to confront the culture change that you have to um, undertake uh, and it's difficult and it's hard and you can't give up, which is why I say we need courage. Um, I don't think we need more tips necessarily. I think they're, we've been at this for 40 something years, you know, there are tons of tips. I, I think we need courage. Um, I hope that uh, my answers were satisfactory and I look forward to doing this again. Power is a critical component of equity work. As stated in the Media 2070 project, discussions about diversity in the media tend to solely focus on issues of inclusion and representation, oftentimes in regards to hiring and coverage. While diversity efforts inside the newsroom and media outlets are important, they alone are not enough. I do think that what we have to recognize is that we can't mistake presence for power, said Color of Change President Rashad Robinson. Power is the ability to change the rules. Presence is not bad, but when we mistake presence for power, we can sometimes think something has happened that hasn't actually happened. To close out, we're going to hear from journalists of color nationally and locally on advice they have for newsrooms to meet this moment. Newsrooms rising up to meet the challenge of the future by paying Black women what they're worth and believing them when they say so. Being managed well. A big raise for promotion and a willingness for the paper's leaders to confront misogynistic and racist patterns. If my bosses have been serious about investing in me and my professional development, whether through promotions or just cultivating my abilities, I likely would have stayed. I would have felt like my input was valued. I think what really ripped my heart apart was the fact that I felt like I did just about everything right, paid my dues, networked, bolstered my resume, and it still wasn't enough, in part because the game was rigged. Better work-life balance, less toxic work environment. I was burnt out and had to leave for my own mental health and well-being. My health was in decline towards the end of my newsroom experience because of stress and anxiety. Any help from management or leadership with changing my situation would have helped me to not leave. Organizations need to not only employ more JOCs, but people of color and Philadelphia natives in various positions to influence decision making. Clearer and more frequent communication with staff about deeper issues. Commit to acting on recommendations from staff and third party consultants. Just as communities feel trust when they feel invested in or buy-in into media outlets, 
so too do newsroom staff find it easier to trust if they, we, feel part of a collaboration. Allowing for input from staff of color without getting defensive. More of an understanding that while we're all trying and have made progress in diversity and equity in the past few years, it's still not where it should be and that there's not much diversity in all teams. Confronting and honestly spelling out the actual dated and problematic systems currently within these newsrooms. More mentorship programs within organizations that make moving up and attainment of power possible. Thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation. We hope that it's helpful for your work as you're imagining how to build new systems in your place in the ecosystem. Now, that's all that we have for today, but we hope you'll join us tomorrow where we'll dive deeper into community information needs as well as learning more about systemic oppression so that we can start to rebuild new systems. Thanks so much and we'll see you tomorrow.